last month, uh, Ms. Newton had asked us if we could give an update on educator uh, preparation programs, kind of a high level overview. And over the past several months, Ms. Saracini's team in educator effectiveness has been really digging in and working on a lot of different things around ed prep. And so we've got several of the team members here today and um, I'll introduce them um, and well, let's go ahead and do that. Um, we have Edie Stewart and we have Charlie Croson and Joan Luno. These are three of the team members that really focus their um, attention on ed educator preparation. And they have spent the last several months visiting every one of our ed prep providers. Um, they are regularly engaging with um, the providers with um, also our Ed Rising, which is our student groups that are in several of our schools now. We're seeing tremendous growth in all of that. So that makes me feel really good about some of the things I'm gonna share with you today because we're gonna identify some, um, some concerns that we have. But we're also going to um, highlight our next steps and what we see as the solution and the way we really do transform educator preparation in Arkansas. And why is this important? One reason is that the K-12 public um, school system is the largest singer, single employer group in the state of Arkansas. So let that sink in for just a minute. Over 70,000 employees are part of the K-12 public education system. We invest a lot of resources in, our, in the education of our K-12 students, and I am so thankful for that. I'm so thankful to be in a state where a substantial amount of the state budget goes towards the education of our children. And that's why it is critically important that when we focus on the factor that makes the most difference in the achievement of a child, that is the classroom teacher. And the preparation, having a well-prepared educator is where it all starts. So we'll start with the teacher pipeline. And several of you probably think, oh, this looks familiar, right? We've shown these charts before. Now, the good thing about this chart is when we first started showing it, does anybody remember what the chart looked like? It was a steep decline, wasn't it? And it was alarming. And it really got our attention. And for a few years, we were really focused on that. Then along about 15, 16, we started noticing, well, we're not seeing that steep decline. We're starting to level out. And so in some ways, that we felt a lot better about that. Because not only were we leveling out, we're starting to see an increase in the diversity of our ed prep candidates, which is a positive thing. So we were working really hard to address the enrollment in ed prep programs and to also attract a more diverse group of candidates. But enrollment in ed prep alone is not gonna be enough. And so as we've gone through the past few years, what we're starting to see now are results of an enrollment that was substantially lower from prior years. And we are also seeing that those program completer numbers are not quite as high as those enrollment numbers, right? So from that, we can understand that when you, when you look at the year of enrollment and project out about two years, maybe three for those candidates to complete, We've got a gap there between those enrollments and those completers. And then when you look at this chart, and this chart is part of that Ed Prep report as well, over the last several years, when you look at that bottom, those state percentages, about 60% of those completers will actually go to work the year after they complete in an Arkansas public school. Okay, so when you think about that number of completers each year, Oh, I don't think I'm going backwards, Dan. Okay, so you look at that number of completers, 1,848, and then if you think about 60% of 1,848, we lose about 40% somewhere. And so for the last few years, we've talked about, well, what are some of the reasons why teachers don't go to the classroom the year after they complete a program? And there are several reasons. What is the impact of that though? When you start looking at, I'm gonna come back to this in a moment. When you start looking at 
the actual number of teachers who are employed in the workforce. So that blue line is representing the number of Arkansas beginning teachers each year since 2012-2013. That red line is representing that number of completers. And so as you look at that, what do we see? That gap is getting what? That gap's getting wider. Okay, so when we look at the percent of those employed versus the percent of those prepared, we're starting to see some alarming numbers there in that we have in, uh, in the 2021 school year, we had a 48% gap between the number of educators who were prepared and ready to go to work with our students and the ones who were actually hired. And so we start thinking about, okay, who's in the classrooms? Where are, um, where are teachers coming from? And I think probably a lot of you know based on what you see here a lot because more and more you're starting to have a lot of requests for what in your board meetings every month? Waivers. Waivers, okay? Now there are some candidates who maybe didn't go to work back um, that year after they completed a program. Maybe they went to work on their master's degree. Maybe they um, took a year off and, and, and did something else. Maybe they didn't pass their all their licensure assessments and needed a little more time. There are a lot of different ways that we're finding teachers, but we also know that we are seeing more and more teachers who are teaching on an actual 40 waiver. Our number of long-term subs is about twice what it was last year. We're also seeing um, increasing percentages of districts that have high percentages of teachers who are not fully licensed to teach what they're teaching. And so, we have got to address that gap. That gap that in 2012-2013 was only 8%, now is at 48%. We've got to take action. And so, this is what our team has worked together to provide. And when I say our team, it isn't just educator effectiveness. It isn't even just our teams within the DESE division. This is a result because of what transformation now allows us to do so much easier than what we tried to do four or five years ago. We actually started talking about this five, six years ago, Secretary Key, but it's so hard to do when you have different groups that are not all together. So now under the Department of Education umbrella, we have the right groups that can work together to get things done very quickly. We have our division of of CTE, working with our Division of Educator Effectiveness. And why is that important? Because these courses that are the pre-educator program of study, those are also CTE courses. So our students are able to engage in career preparation training, real preparation, real training for a career very early on in high school. We also have our Division of Higher Ed that has been at the table regularly so not only are we getting things worked out for the four-year degree, we now have those opportunities for those students to um, earn their Associates of Arts and Teaching at a lot of different institutions around the state. And we're gonna review all of that. So I want to start the conversation about the Arkansas Teacher Residency, which will be coming in the fall of 2022. So let's get ready for it. So what is this? It's really thinking differently about ed prep. A true teacher residency model when we think about preparation. And so when you think of another profession that has a residency model and how they prepare um, their workforce, what comes to mind? The medical profession, right? In a medical profession, a, a surgeon doesn't just walk out of a preparation program, get handed a license, and immediately go do surgery, correct? We hope not, okay? We know that that surgeon has years of on-the-job training where they're working, they're learning, they're getting experience, they're getting coaching, they're getting, they're experiencing good and bad. They're making some mistakes, but they're learning how to correct that and they're learning how to be that professional. So what's so exciting about a teacher residency is it actually can get started in high school. We can um, now allow our students to um, begin their uh, career-focused education 
they can earn a credential as a certified teaching assistant, and then they'll be eligible to participate in a teacher residency pathway to complete not only a four-year degree, but also their license. The certified teaching assistant isn't just limited to high school students. This certification will also be available to current paraprofessionals in the workforce because we know we have some awesome professionals that some may have some college hours, some may not, but they are committed to kids. They're already there. They're already working. They're already gaining that field experience that they need. So when we think about why a teacher residency model is needed, they're getting preparation based on authentic quality clinical experiences and the opportunity to work while meeting qualifications for teaching teacher licensure. So that's something though, an opportunity to work. How many of you had a job while you maybe were going to uh, work on your um, college degree? Okay. Oftentimes those jobs consist of what? Working late at night, working on the weekends, sometimes working two and three jobs. Okay. This is going to give future teachers, rising educators, as Charlie calls them, the opportunity to work and earn a, um, earn a wage while they're going to college. Working in a school system, becoming an employee of a public school system, what, el what else could you be eligible for? If you're in a, you could be in a, eligible for teacher retirement. You could be eligible for insurance. So at a young age, while you're gaining this um, experience, not to mention the affordability that we're gonna look at here in a minute for earning your degree and solving a teacher shortage while this is going on, but also becoming a true professional very early on. Okay, so what is a certified teaching assistant? This is the, the definition that we will work from. If someone will become a CTA when they have um, earned nine hours of college coursework and passed um, the Parapro assessment. And with that um, college coursework comes work experience or field experience. So this can be a high school student that's getting to take these courses while in high school. It can be someone post high school that is also um, um, able to do this. So um, these courses here, when we say nine hours of cor um, college coursework, these are the equivalent courses of what the um, ed pre-educator program of study within our CTE, this is what that will transfer to. And the great thing about our CTE pathways is that students are getting to be a completer in a career field. They're getting to take a lot of other electives as well, so they can really build up their skills in a lot of education related areas. And those concurrent credit hours, there's a lot more flexibility in the enrollment for a student who is um, enrolling through a CTE pathway. So sometimes students that have a barrier because maybe they don't have a 19 on an ACT, there are flexible admission requirements that can be attached to those courses to give them that early start, to give them that early chance to earn college bearing credit. And so by the time they leave high school and go to college, they're ready they've already had that experience. So the teacher residency model really is consists of two steps. One is we need school districts to offer the CTA credential to high school students and paraprofessionals, okay? But the beauty of this, it's not just the school district responsibilities because although the district is going to need to do their part, the higher ed partner is also going to be involved. The hired institutions are going to be um, providing flexible options, providing those concurrent credit MOUs so that those students taking the high school coursework are able to earn the concurrent credit or making those um, courses available for, for paraprofessionals at a time when they can take those courses, whether they're online options that have uh, the field experience documented from the current work they're doing or um, whether they're meeting in um, groups, um, maybe a couple of times a month on a, on a Saturday. So the higher ed is coming up with that flexible scheduling option. And then together, they're uh, working to make sure that, the, uh, that there's a teacher 
who can teach those courses for concurrent credit. And I want to pause here because we have already been talking to superintendents and um, presidents of our two and four year universities. And at every turn, we have heard the higher ed partners say, if a school district is having trouble getting a teacher who can teach for concurrent credit, we're gonna make sure that we can make one available. So that true commitment, that true partnership is there. There's no reason that we can't make this happen. The second step is gonna be personalizing the CTA licensure pathway. Okay, so we've created some non-negotiables and the non-negotiables mean that through this residency model, there have to be coaches to support the students while they're completing their degree requirements. So whether those are academic coaches that the higher ed institution employs to kind of provide those wraparound services because we don't want this to be an online degree program where people are never, um, never associated with that two or four year institution that they're attending. We want them to feel welcome and supported, not only there, but we want those coaches on site so they see firsthand what's going on in the life of a new teacher or in the life of a, a teacher in training. Um, cohorts where all of these teacher residents can come together. And then the opportunity for student-facing work. And that student-facing work will increase as the, the candidate progresses through educa their educator preparation program. They'll be getting licensure assessment support. So we don't want to hear that three years from now our candidates still are coming out of preparation programs and not having passed their um, licensure assessment. That should not happen. If they're being well prepared to teach well what they're um, choosing to teach. They should be passing all of the, um, the assessments and we wanna make sure that they have the financial aid guidance so they're not saddled with debt when they complete their, um, their program. And so um, the, the residency model is basically three levels for the um, certified teaching assistants who will be the residents at level one that's when they're getting started in their program. So if it's a student coming out of high school, it's most likely that freshman, sophomore year of college, although now with concurrent credit opportunities, we know that sometimes that happens quicker than in two years, right? But up until the time that they have earned an associate's degree or they're ready to be admitted into an ed prep program, they'll be at that level one. And at that level one, the work requirement is that they're um, able to work at least 10 hours in a school doing what we're calling student facing work. So engage with students in teaching and learning opportunities. So that may be someone who's doing tutoring. It may be someone who is um, working as a um, student aide or a paraprofessional. And they may be working part time, they could even be working full time. We just want to have at least the 10 hours. As they get admitted into an educator preparation program and really get focused on the um, licensure level and content area that they're gonna teach, we want their work hours to increase. And so as part of the residency, the number of work hours will increase and the focus of the work will increase. So you may have school districts that really wanna focus on growing special education teachers or they may want to focus on growing um, math teachers who also can teach special education students. So in these schools, we're going to see these candidates being recruited and being trained and being given those work opportunities so that they're learning to work with um, not only students in the area of math, but students with special needs. And then as they transition into that final part, of their ed prep program. So what you've been hearing a lot about when um, we have student interns coming, we want that final semester or year to be a true uh, internship where that resident is taking over the classroom. For all intents and purposes, they are the teacher, but they're not the teacher of record by themselves. They are the teacher who has that support of that master or lead professional who is there helping them prepare, helping to watch them teach and giving them feedback 
on um, little tips and, and techniques like I saw yesterday to model things. You know, I won't forget that because I got to see a master at work. But also, that can be there to help guide them through their first parent-teacher conference. Someone who can be there to make sure that when they get assigned lunch duty the first week of school, knows how to interact with junior high students who are out by a tree smoking, okay? Because as a first year teacher, if you've never had that experience, it's really hard to argue with a 13 year old. And y'all know that. So we want these teachers to have already had those experiences so that they know how to respond to students in any situation. So when we think about how are we going to get our educators there, you actually got to see this slide last month. And then the next slide you got to see and you weren't quite as excited as I want you to be, but you're gonna to be today because of <laughs> everything that I've just told you. How do we do this? Well, we make sure that every road that leads to licensure is the right fit and the right preparation so that our teachers are day one ready. And this group back here from Ed Prep, that is a, a focus of theirs right now. They've conducted focus groups all across the state. They're putting together with Ed Prep the um, kinds of learning experiences that are needed so that we have day one ready teachers. And I would submit that this residency model is the single best thing that we can do to have day one ready educators in the future. And so whether we continue to have um, candidates who come straight out of high school to a four-year university, or whether we have those candidates who work through the community college, either of those pathways can be part of that residency model. It's not a new program that they're going to have to complete. Our higher ed partners are just gonna be part of that step one and two with our school districts. We still have the alternate routes that are now preparing a substantial number of our teachers. And we want to keep those in place. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. <clears throat> if a high school student obtains a CPA, how, what would that translate into credit hours at a university? So at the nine hours would be that the criteria in order to earn that certificate. And it would be um, the nine hours that would fit within the pre-educator program of study and also passing the Parapro assessment. From there, it, they would go on and they could either complete a two-year associate degree or go on through the four-year program. So that nine hours is kind of the jump start. It would be, um, I think it's gonna be the equivalent of like a certificate of proficiency if they were just to do it um, straight at the college level. Yeah, and we're, and we're working through that process to get all of the courses aligned. I'm looking back here, pretty much this whole row back here is working to align those courses with the higher ed courses. And um, I've, I've talked about this enough with higher ed folks that nobody has come up and said you are dead wrong. So I feel like I'm, I'm pretty much in line with everything they're saying. Okay, so we're, we're lining those pathways up so it'll be ready to go. And, and Ivy, just to clarify, that's just the nine hours for this program. That if there are other hours that students are able to take uh, or sure. AP credits or anything like oh, that, yeah. then that's stackable on this. So, yeah. Yes, we may have students that complete their associate degree before they even leave oh, high school. Right, right. Absolutely, might be. Um, so, so there are no, uh, numerous opportunities while they're in high school taking those. Um, um, courses, those concurrent courses within that um, CTA pathway, the concurrent challenge um, is available along with other ways um, for that tuition and to be taken care of for students so they're not going to have the cost of that. If um, they, um, so this is the slide I want y'all to get excited about, remember it? <laughs> I know you've seen it, okay. So um, this, on this, if the student chooses to start at a two-year institution, um, then we uh, now have the opportunity because of the shortage area in the field of education that the AR Future um, grant will pay for that tuition. So um, the opportunity is there for the student not to have any cost to earn their associate degree. 
and then they can transfer over. And we've outlined these are already existing programs that are available to candidates. And um, even in addition to this, there could be other types of, of financial aid that could be available to a candidate. So think about the opportunities that our young people have to complete um, a four-year degree, a licensure program, while they're getting experience on the job and doing something that they love and can love for a long time and doing it all without having to incur any debt um, for their college education. To me, that is exciting. That's a barrier that had been in place for a long time. Um, you can see here um, on the map where those institutions are. And because several of those institutions have received regional workforce grants, that's where when they're partnering with um, the high schools, they're able to come up with some of those additional supports that maybe in the past um, higher ed programs might not have always had. So I'm gonna pause there for just a moment to see if you have some questions. I just have one follow-up to Mr. Sutton. Is there any point, I guess it would be when they move to level two, that they can actually earn college credit while they're working? That is the whole, that's the whole premise of this. Oh, okay. While they're working, they're going to school. So that's where the personalization from okay. higher ed comes in. So that um, maybe some of their coursework is done online, okay. but their work work is can the count for the class. experiential okay. credit. And so they're not having to go longer. They're not having to jump through a lot of hoops. Um, you know, there will be higher ed, um, you know, this will change some of what higher ed does in terms of how they look at programs and what can count for experiential learning or maybe um, the pace of coursework or things like that may may change a little bit or be combined um, but really the opportunities are limitless here so yes sir yes this is such an incredible opportunity um, just listening to that the things you've shared um, and I hope and hopefully you didn't mention it it was an oversight on my behalf whenever they complete the program what type of commitment that ensures that they stay in Arkansas so we get a return on the investment? So there are no, I guess, specific strings that are tied to the residency model itself, okay? However, um, if I'm in a school district and if I am hiring residents as part, if I'm hiring CTAs to come and work through their residency program, I have the opportunity to work with them as far as tuition assistance, but having commitments signed, I have the opportunity to give them their contracts a little bit early and entice them to stay with me. I have the opportunity to help them um, find those things that they're gonna love about my district. Um, so that they're going to want to stay. I think the data really support the fact that um, most teachers are teaching in a close proximity to where they went to high school. And so I think that if we're creating the opportunities, if they are um, already developing the connections, already developing um, the professional relationships and having opportunities, then that is going to really be a driver to stay. I think this piece here, um, because this isn't just a recruitment tool and preparation tool, this is also a retention tool. Because if I'm in a district, I'm going to need my designated master and lead professionals to be part of that level three. Because if I want to be able to fill some vacancies that I have, because these residents will be able to help fill vacancies and take over classrooms if they're under the supervision and direction of a master and lead professional. So the examples that have been brought to you by different institutions and districts, this is the model that we're setting up that they now can work through. And these master and lead professionals can earn additional stipends and they're having that opportunity to really lead from the classroom. They're having the opportunity to help shape and mentor our future teachers. So um, we've been setting up timelines that um, we're gonna be working through. Um, we are having uh, meetings with two and four year ed prep programs. We're having meetings with 
um, superintendents in every co-op. Um, the team here is working on MOUs and updates to courses so that by January, February, we're able for our high school principals and counselors um, to start putting um, these courses on the master schedule, start helping to recruit students into that early pre-educator program of study, um, promoting this through higher ed, but it's not gonna happen without a comprehensive campaign. And so that is something we're gonna be really working on. Um, Ms. Post and some of our teachers of the year have already um, started coming up with some ideas to help. Um, I think our novice teachers within their novice teacher mentoring programs, I think we can find some really good ways to plug them in and to really help recruit because every single district can um, now have the opportunity to grow their own um, workforce. I think it's pretty exciting. So um, I'll pause and see if there are any other questions or comments. I think it's better than exciting. I think it's super. I think I think so too. Super. Maybe you said this earlier. In years past, when a student did their student teaching in a school in a classroom, they w would not be paid, or maybe even could not be paid. So this is this a district decision if if the student teacher is paid. I'm not talking about the paraprofessional that's already working. Sure. So within the residency model, part of that is that the candidate is employed in a school district. And so by the time they get to that, that student intern piece, yes, they would continue to be working and could be paid for the student teaching. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read you just something really brief because this all has come together at the same time. But. Um, Arkansas Tech had their alumni magazine and I just happened to flip through it one night and um, she probably doesn't know I'm going to read this about her today but she was in the magazine so um, Brooke Custer always believed in the power of her dreams upon graduating in May 2021 Custer had a teaching job lined up in Marshall Arkansas Inspired by her high school agriculture teacher in Waldron, Custer knew she wanted to follow in his footsteps by the time that she graduated. Um, Custer excelled in her classes and was one semester away from graduating when an unexpected event almost postponed her degree plans. Custer had to become the legal guardian of her younger sibling, Dakota. So, um, I'll, and I'll summarize the rest of the story. So, this candidate, had been saving up money from her job so that she didn't have to work while she student taught. When her family circumstances changed, she wasn't gonna be able to afford to quit her job. So she wasn't gonna to get to student teach because she didn't get paid for student teaching. Thankfully, Arkansas Tech had a program in place and they call it um, the Fight on Fund and she had another teacher from Arkansas Tech who had been part of her um, education and said, don't, you're not dropping out, give me a day to figure this out. And they found a way to help provide the financial support so she could go ahead and student teach and she could graduate. And I believe Ross has checked and she is teaching. What district? Okay, she's at Marshall. So she was able to make it. And I'm very thankful that Tech took that on. But why do we have to do that? Why do we have to make choices? Why do we have to have our students that they're worried and that they're working and working and working to save up enough so they hope that they can make it? It shouldn't be, an, it shouldn't be a lottery for our teachers to have good jobs. It shouldn't be a lottery for our kids to have access to quality teachers. It doesn't have to be that way. So that's what I'm hoping every institution can realize. It doesn't have to be that way. If we create this type of a model and if we can bring together our school districts and our institutions that already are doing so much great work, if we can bring them together and make this happen, then we have day one ready teachers who are able to start their careers miles ahead of where they would otherwise. 
And so I'm really excited. And um, it's going to be a lot of hard work. We probably are going to have some mistakes along the way and have to kind of step back. But the only thing I've asked of, of our teams when we come together is that, I, you know, I know at some point you're going to find issues, fix it. Whatever we got to do, we're going to fix it because this is too important. So I think that's all. And um, there are some, some good financial opportunities too. We're working with districts about um, possibility of um, um, how this might fit in with Arkansas's apprenticeship model. And so with apprenticeships, there can be um, opportunities for wage reimbursement and our um, team at the Office of Skills Development is working with us on that. So got a lot of people who are going to help make this happen.